bilimsel ve teknik analizleriniz ve yorumlarınızı dinledik. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Benim bir iki sorum olacak. Bu resim tablolardaki kullanılan resim yaparken kullanılan 17. yüzyılda pigmentlerde yağlar kullanılıyor. Dün de buna değinildi. İşte keten yağı, susam yağı, zeytin yağı vesaire kullanılabiliyor. Bunlar sırasıyla kısa, orta ve uzun vadede kuruyan yağ çeşitleri. Ee, bu yağların, bu yağ çeşitlerinin kullanımı resmin yaşına ne kadar etki ediyor? Hangi yağ resmin yaşı için daha önemli? Ee, tüm yaptığınız analizlerde mutlaka bunun üzerinde e, bir şeyiniz olmuştur. E, i̇kincisi e, vernik kullanılıyor. Resimlerin resim bittikten sonra üzerine vernik kullanılıyor. Bu kullanılan vernik e, resmin e, resmi koruma amaçlı bir yerde bir yerde parlaklık verdiği için deniyor. Acaba kullanılan yağların e, cinsine göre e, vernik kullanılmalı mı kullanılmamalı mı? E, özellikle 17. yüzyılda Rembrandt'ın resimlerinde hangi yağlar kullanılmış? Bunları tespiti yapıldı mı? Bir de e, infraruj ışınlarının ile analiz ederken kullanılan bu yağların e, etkisi ne kadar e, önemli oluyor? Yani e, daha net bir görüntü veya daha az bir görüntü bunun etkileri neler? Bunları öğrenmek istiyorum sizi bulmuşken. <gülüyor> Teşekkür ederim. Thank you very much. To start with the last part of your question, how does the oils influence the infrared image? They do not. To my best knowledge, uh, but I know there are two scientists here, uh, so please assist me if I am on the wrong track. But uh, to my best knowledge, I have never seen oils having any influence on the infrared image. They do not uh, distinct this at all. Uh, there are different oils in use. Uh, you have walnut oil, you have uh, different uh, other oils. You never have uh, olive oil because it's a non completely non-drying oil. I have never seen that in an oil painting at least. But there could be a variety of oils and they have different properties. Some dry quicker, some dry slower. But the artist know what to do about this because he can add certain dryers to the oil to make it dry like lead white will make the oil dry up very hard uh, that's the nature of lead as a drying agent red lead mixed in the lead itself uh, with the oil itself could also uh, add to this you could also heat uh, linseed oil which also improves its drying capacities a lot of the earth pigments contains metals of various kinds that also increase drying properties of oils um, Rembrandt's oils uh, are different. Uh, he uses both walnut oil, poppy oil, and linseed oil. Depends on where he paints on a painting. And I'm sure that uh, Albert Kuyf, with his uh, with his scene of the uh, of the landscapes here, he could have used uh, poppy oil or uh, something like that for the sky, because the artists of this period knew very well that linseed oil will yellow, will darken over time, but some of the other oils do not. Linseed oil will become yellow over time, and if you have a blue sky and you use a binding medium like linseed oil, which will turn yellow, yellow and blue together becomes a very terrible sky to look at. So they would use sometimes a different, uh, different oils for certain parts in a painting to be able to keep them more stable at least those artists who had a sense for durability. A lot of artists would use linseed oil for everything because it was now the painting looked nice, it's now I sell it, I don't care what it looks like in a hundred years.
because there was a, a huge mass production. So it depends very much on the sensibility of the individual artist. And to know more about this sensibility, that's why we need to uh, have CATS and all the other centers that CATS can collaborate with to learn more about the sensibility of the artists. How much did they actually know about this? Uh, there are several manuals and manuscripts that talks about uh, how to mix pigments and oils and what to avoid to do in order not to create something that doesn't work. Uh, so so there, is, there is a large sensitivity uh, or knowledge about this between the artists already in the, uh, in the 15th and 16th, 17th century. This is the Maurits house in The Hague once again. Uh, in here is the Prime Minister's office. It's not so important though. Here we have a small balcony and here are a number of people standing looking at something. And what they are looking through is a window here and they can look down on top of the head of my colleague and I would have been sitting here so they could look down on our heads. We wanted to have daylight for a public restoration of the view of Delft, which is here, and the girl with the pearl earring standing on the easel over here. The reason we wanted to do this as a public event was uh, that at this particular moment, the conservation studio of the Maurits House, which was a few blocks away, was being shut down. The house was going to be demolished and the studio was being temporarily put out in a suburb of The Hague, where security was not sufficient for this kind of paintings. So we thought, why don't we make a public restoration? The public will still see the paintings, although under transformation, um, and the security will be the same as usual within the Marriott's house. So we created this glass wall, and the conservator is sitting in here, like in a fish tank, um, there was explanation out here. You could take down ear, earphones, uh, headphones, and listen to various stories about why we were doing this and what was the intention of this conservation treatment. We had an entire international committee following this conservation treatment. Hubert von Sonnenberg from the Metropolitan Museum was part of the committee, a director of the uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington, in London, and uh, Munich were participating in overlooking what we as conservators would do, what happens along the way, and how we can interpret the eventual changes that might come out of this. In order to restore these two paintings, both of them icons in Dutch 17th century art, we wanted to understand the rest of Vermeer's oeuvre before starting this treatment, to examine uh, the other paintings. And Vermeer has left only 34 paintings, Again, one of these very small oeuvres, 34 paintings in total, we know by Vermeer, maybe 35. Some artists, art historians would say 36, but I believe it's 34. Uh, we sent surveys out to the other uh, owners of these paintings, asking them all kinds of questions about technique, material, canvas, uh, thread counts, ground layers, all this that I've been talking to you about, in order to understand what is this master doing and comparing this with our two own paintings. Here you have the, a close-up of the girl with the pearl uh, before restoration. Uh, you see a kind of a yellow varnish, you see a kind of a hazy image, like early photographs of uh, actors in uh, black and white movie films. Uh, we have an UV image of the girl where we can see brush strokes here that are restorations applied in the not too distant uh, past. Uh, it was restored in 1951. Uh, that was the latest treatment before I took over in 1994. And uh, you see also there is some haziness here or some, some dark tonality here uh, which corresponds to uh, a damage in the painting because when you see the X-radiograph of that area you can see that there is a lot, lot of losses. These are more black spots that you see here. They are uh, places where the original paint has been flaking off and is lost forever. And filling up these with, with new filling materials that the conservators use and retouching it doesn't show on the X-radiograph. So we knew it was a damaged painting. 
It is a very damaged painting, actually. It's not very big uh, either. It's a little bit bigger than the Vermeer you have on show in here, uh, this size. But uh, when the painting in uh, the late uh, 19th century, in 1890s, were on an auction, uh, the people who sold the painting had no idea it was a Vermeer. Um, it was bought by a collector for two euros uh, and a few cents for the auctionarius. And uh, shortly afterwards, it was discovered to be a Vermeer painting. And of course, today, it's uh, impossible to figure out how much uh, value it has. Uh, and it was later, in 1904, I believe, it was donated to the Maritz House as a, as a gift. But because it was not recognized as a painting by Vermeer might be the reason that it was not taken care of. It has a lot of damages, especially along the bottom edge, where it has been hanging up towards a damp or humid wall, or standing in an attic or whatever, so uh, there's been a lot of change temperature changes in that particular area of the painting, which, which caused these damages. Well, one of the issues was to remove the yellow varnish, and when a conservator uh, composes mixtures of solvents and dips a cotton swab in it to remove varnish, you know very well that this is one of the most crucial actions you can do as a conservator. Because when you remove things, uh, it's gone. When you apply things, when you do retouching in painting, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. You can either get fired or you can do it again. Uh, but removing things uh, is, is always very tricky. So we needed a lot of research into what type of varnish was applied here. Well, we know that it was restored in 1951. Uh, the conservator in 1951 used a natural resin called Dama, probably one of the types that's been used throughout many centuries to give this particular painting or many other paintings its, uh, its saturation. So we, did, we found a solvent mixture that would react with Dama varnish, and some of these uh, greenish uh, off-colored retouchings here from 1951 that didn't match the surroundings would go with it as well, fortunately. Although the conservator in 1951 was using oil paint uh, to retouch with, oil paint which essentially <coughs> has the same solubility parameters as the old oil paint by Vermeer. But thanks to that it being so much younger, not aged too much, and thanks to a, a thin layer of varnish in between, it was possible to, to also remove these retouchings. But look here, what a difference. It's a huge difference that occurs here, and where uh, people who don't know what's going on are beginning to put questions to what are conservators really doing with our artworks? Are they not ruining these pieces? Are they not doing damage to them? Um, and it was very good we had this public restoration during this, this treatment as well, because we could continue to explain also what happened here. And what happens here is what, what I mentioned early on when we talked about uh, Bosch and Bruegel, when I talked to you about the painting by Bosch that had been in the chimney to be aged artificially. Uh, what happened here was that when the, my predecessor in 1951 had cleaned the girl with the pearl and had come down to a surface like this, the curators and the conservator together, but mainly the curators, insisted you cannot show a painting that is so bright. You have to cover it up again. And it was therefore varnished two or three times with a yellow varnish, a varnish that already had some yellow tonality to it, a dama varnish, uh, as I told you before, will yellow over time. So often you would have to remove it, let's say, every 50, 60, 80 years and substitute it with a new varnish that is transparent and translucent. Um, but he would apply, according to, to people who saw that happen, yellow varnish, but that was not all. Uh, Karin Grun, the scientist that also did the Rembrandt research, uh, uh, research um, analyzed this varnish and found black pigment in it. So before, after cleaning, while varnishing, the conservator would put black down in the already yellow varnish to obscure even more the brightness of this particular painting. Out of the notion that old master paintings 
do need to have a golden glow. They have to look old. They have to look as if they've been sitting in a room with elderly gentlemen smoking big cigars and drinking whiskey. <laughs> they have to look like Rembrandt. Um, and this notion was, was discussed and argued about already very early on in the 20th century. The, a former director of the Marx House in 1909-10 gave an interview where he said to the journalist, I do know that it's kind of strange that we apply this what's called gallery tone to the, to the painting after treatment. Uh, and if I had this painting at home, I would never do it. But, you know, we are public institutions and for the sake of the public, we need to do this. For the sake of the public, what kind of argument is this? And uh, we were pretty surprised to see that this also happened all the way up till 1951. And we have seen more paintings in the Marat House where this happened up until the mid-1960s, and then it stopped. But until then, uh, so all of you who have been in the Marat House before, and your uh, parents or whatever, they have not been able to see the brilliant colors that the 17th century artists really worked with. They've been, you've been seeing images that have been manipulated by a curatorial staff uh, with their assistants being the conservators, uh, manipulating some of these paintings into looking what you are supposed to see and not what you find the artist intent uh, was uh, what he wanted you to see. So this was a dramatic change for this painting, but fully explainable. And by having a public uh, restoration, we could explain this very clearly, and as it progressed, which was uh, avoiding us to having any kind of uh, dispute between the public and the museum about this. Um, for those of you who want to know more about this kind of disputes, there is something called the cleaning controversy, uh, which is a, a, a phenomenon that pops up at regular intervals, but there is a cleaning controversy that mainly uh, takes its starting point from uh, the National Gallery in London, who during the Second World War uh, in Wales restored a number of the paintings uh, in their collection. And after the war, in 1947 I believe, they presented paintings restored during the war. And there the press fell over them and said, what have you done? And you've damaged and ruined our collection. Because they were not prepared to see these images with that vibrant color scheme that the artist uh, originally wanted them to be. And it's, of course, hopeless, arrogant or ignorant to believe that an artist in the 17th century would paint a painting in bright colors just to hope that the varnish over time would make the colors, uh, temper the color. He would paint it in the tone that he would want to do it. He would be able to do that anyhow. So, um, well, here's a before and after of the ear of the girl with the pearl. You see the pearl hanging down here. And uh, you can see that the pearl here before restoration shows one big highlight from the light that falls down on the pearl from upper, upper left. See a small reflection and this uh, semicircular reflection down here. After treatment, you can see that this one, I don't know if you can see it from down there, but it's like a little fried egg. Uh, where the, the little bit in the middle that should be yellow in the egg is white as well. Uh, it appeared that that didn't belong to the painting at all. It had been interpreted by an art historian in the past as the very enigmatic pearl with three highlights, a uh, subtle reflection of this highlight within the pearl, the translucency <coughs> of the pearl. But it appears that this little white dot in the middle is a piece of paint that has fallen out somewhere else on the painting, landed here, and been stuck while it was being lined with the hot iron, and then uh, some gesso material, filling material, had landed around it. So it does not belong at all to the original composition. This is what the pearl looked like, and it does not look much like a pearl, more like, yeah, well, a glass pearl maybe, that's being formed by the highlight here and the reflection from the white color of the girl up underneath the, the, the, uh, the drop uh, formed, uh, glass ball maybe, uh, that gives it then its, its uh, reflection. This makes me think of Samuel von Hochstraten uh, again. I mentioned him earlier on that he was writing about uh, the Dutch artists and their methods and techniques. 
uh, Samuel Hochstraten, who died in, in uh, 1678, and Vermeer, who died in 1675, apparently did not know each other because Vermeer is not mentioned in Hochstraten's publication. But Hochstraten writes uh, a lot about light, uh, how light falls around in room and outside. And uh, Hochstraten describes that when you paint like this, then Vermeer has painted the direct light and the indirect light, or the light and the wrong light, uh, funnily enough, and the indirect light, the second light, the first light, and the second light, as he mentioned as well, is the reflected light. And it is the reflected light, actually, here, that forms the shape of this pearl. Well, we, lo we lost a little highlight here, I'm afraid, uh, that was praised by some. But here we have a detail of, of the, the chin of the girl and her mouth. And when that was uh, cleaned from varnish, uh, we were fortunate to find a highlight that could compensate from the first one. This highlight is original. And it contains, contains of two small brush strokes. One is pink and one is more whitish, applied over each other to kind of illustrate the moisture and the dampness of the lips of the girls, of the girl. And you have kind of light here on her, on her chin, which is again the reflected light from her white color below. So just like Rembrandt's old woman with the book, where the, light, where the book is a reflector of light, Rembrandt, uh, Vermeer, Sorry, Vermeer is very aware of how uh, light plays around in the, in the uh, room. Now here's my predecessor from 1951, who is retouching uh, various spots on the painting. Um, and he's doing uh, the very best to his ability. Um, after the painting now was cleaned by me in uh, 1994, my colleague, uh, uh, Nicola Costaras from the Victorian Albert uh, Museum, that's where she works now, she worked with me. She did the restoration and you see it was slightly different, uh, being very cautious with the headgear of a loop optimizer to be able to hit exactly where you should and not to cover up, uh, make any mistakes in uh, obscuring highlights or reflections that Vermeer had wanted us to see. So here you have uh, a closer detail uh, with the pearl, with the highlights here. There's a little highlight over here as well, around the lips of the girl. The color that reflects the light up here under the pearl and the, the, the uh, cheekbone. But you also see certain highlights out here in her yellow, yellow green dress. Highlights that we cannot interpret as being helping us to understand how the dress really looks. What is the nature of this blouse of hers? Uh, is, it, uh, is it cotton? Uh, is it wool? Is it so, such, so much wool that there's small threads sticking out that catches the light? As you know, you can see it sometimes in, in woolen textiles. Maybe uh, it is not by the artist described in such a detail that we can recognize what kind of textile it is. And the same goes with this very strange headgear that the girl is wearing a headgear, this turban with, the, with this hanging down, which is completely alien to any headgear of that 17th century. It's purely imaginary, or like when women has been to the bath and come out with a hand a towel around the head uh, to keep the hair uh, while drying. Uh, but also here you have these blots, blobs of paint that kind of indicates reflections without explaining to us what kind of textile this is. It seems like a, a jump, but reflections is the main th theme in this painting uh, when you walk up close to it. This is before restoration. It was also cleaned from varnish. This painting has very few, or actually only one little damage here. This is an x-ray of it. You see the strainer, and you do a, a, see a small damage here. It is a damage that occurred uh, during one of the opening hours when a curtain was being drawn over to hide uh, the painting from the direct sunlight and the curtain fell down and right into the painting sometime in the 1950s and uh, that made that little damage. Um, but the painting was also here cleaned from, from a yellow varnish, a varnish that was also applied 
uh, as it was already yellow in several layers. No black pigment was applied to this particular painting, but it was already uh, a yellowed varnish. Uh, during the treatment, which was the end of, of the 19th century, uh, a shadow of a man was found, and it could not be cleaned clearly away, so the conservator at that time used a scalpel to carve away the upper paint layer to get down to this, this man here to really find him, but he stopped here because he must have had some legs as well, of course. Uh, I put him in this little image here, um, but that was maybe not the best thing the conservator could have done because Vermeer never intended this man to be seen. Uh, in this case, we, we decided, uh, maybe in contradiction to what we did with the painting in Schwerin, but here we decided this paint, this figure was, was really not intended to be seen. So after the restoration where we came down to this level of, of uh, archaeological dig in the painting, we uh, agreed to paint him away again. So he's not visible to you. So this is maybe once in a lifetime for you to see that there was a man here. Um, here we have two women on the, on, the, on the shore. And maybe I should tell you, this is the city of Delft. It's called the View of Delft. It's a city of Delft seen from the south. And looking at Delft from the south uh, and having the sun falling on the houses here tells us that it's very early morning. It's the east sun shining on Delft, light coming in from the right. And uh, you have areas here in shadow. Uh, this is a small river uh, called the Sea, which runs here. And you have small boats here, which are herring fishers. Uh, and herring fishing starts uh, later in spring, so we anticipate that this must be early morning, early spring. Um, there's a clock here, which has been the discussion of what time of the day it is, but it is not, uh, you cannot deduct that. Here are two women in the foreground. Um, having told you that Vermeer only painted 34 paintings, and the early one was from uh, 1656, the one in Dresden, um, and he dies in uh, 1675, then also he is having a very brief career of 25 years. And having a very small production has made people speculate that maybe he was a very fine and detailed painter. A slow painter, but also very detailed painter. I wouldn't call this very detailed. Of course the figures are small, but it's indication of a figure, enough for us to find in our head the image uh, significant enough to see that, this, well, this is a, a female. Looking at this uh, very carefully, uh, we could see that some of these gray stripes over the black skirt of the woman uh, was intercepted by regular cracks in the paint, but some of them would go over these kind of craquelures, craquelures that would be caused by the drying process of the paint and the pigment. So we are back to the, the process of what kind of oils and the effects or defects of some paint layers. Uh, it is a well-known uh, fact that you should paint from meager paint. That means uh, a lean paint towards richer paint. You would start off your painting with having lesser oil in your pigment and you would finish <coughs> off with more oil in the pigment eventually, if you wanted to. But the other way around, having a very oil-rich bottom layer and painting with lesser uh, oil-rich paints on top would cause uh, the blocking of the uh, drying of the oil below, and that would then cause wrinkling or premature cracking, like you see here, of various kinds. But as these gray stripes intercept these and go over these premature cracks, and they seem to be original by Vermeer's hand, it would indicate that Vermeer had painted on the painting at longer intervals. <coughs> that he was a slow painter in the sense of he was slow to decide when he had finished. So he would leave them aside for a month or two or maybe a couple of years and then he would return to it and continue finishing off certain details. And that could be explained by this phenomenon here. This is not by Vermeer. I don't know who painted this portrait, but this is a portrait of an art collector in Delft. Uh, he's called uh, Van Rijven. 
um, he had a diary in which he wrote uh, every time he had visited an artist because he loved art so much that he went around visiting different artists of the time and uh, to see and discuss with them how they created their, their art. And he wrote in his diary here on the 21st of June uh, in French, uh, because that was the aristocracy who spoke French in Holland this part of time, uh, this time. And he writes that he has been to visit him and he writes down here that uh, la partie la plus extraordinaire uh, blah blah blah consists dans la perspective the, the pieces of art that si seems to be the most extraordinary that I have seen in Vermeer's studio are consisting of perspectives now in current days art history the notion of a perspective is something that shows an illusion of depth like the view of Delft but at the moment that Van Rijven visited Vermeer he hadn't painted this painting yet uh, this is what he would have been seeing when he visited Delft. This is called The Girl with the Wine Glass and it hangs in Braunschweig in Germany. Uh, or the art historical, or he would have seen this one, The Astronomer, hanging at the Louvre in Paris. Uh, canvases, the, the Braunschweig painting is large like this, this one is slightly smaller. Uh, where you see the astronomer in his uh, in his uh, studio looking out of the window pondering about what to do with his compass here or this is what art history normally would describe this is a perspective this is uh, Fredemann de Vries uh, a Flemish artist around uh, 1600 who creates these dramatic illusions of spatial illusions of depth in a painting in a canvas by making this illusionary courtroom uh, with people wandering around and with a very clear central perspective uh, in the painting. Friedemann de Vries is also uh, making a handbook in perspectives. It's being printed uh, around uh, 1604, five or six. And here, is, uh, here he's explaining to those who would buy his book on perspectives how a perspective is composed of a horizon line, the horizon which is always out there, and if you put your eye on the horizon, and this is actually a small eye in this print, and you see with an eye, you would see in all these different directions. And on each side, each side of the focal point where your eye is, you would have a distant point on both sides, and when you draw lines in from those, again, you could make a floor like this like these checkered floor that you also see in Peter de Hoek's paintings in the exhibition here and many of the other artists in, in the Rembrandt exhibition, these black and white tiled floors. This is how you can easily compose these kind of floors, he, he writes. This is a perspective. And Samradam, another Dutch painter of the period, uh, Emmanuel Samradam has made this drawing of a church interior he actually was one of the first church portraitists, you could say. He painted portraits of the interior of Dutch church in this particular period. And here he has even <coughs> oops, drawn some of the lines that goes into a small vanishing point here. So there are uh, additional lines in this drawing uh, where you can see how he has composed this illusion of depth. When he would then use this drawing for a painting, he would turn the drawing around, on the back he would apply charcoal uh, on the surface of the painting, put it down on the can a canvas or rather a panel because he always painted on panel and then he would press on top of the contours of his drawing and then like carbon paper the lines of the charcoal on the back would be visible on the surface and then he could start painting. A very tedious way of doing this and he would be able to paint this is a different church but that is the way he would transfer a drawing to his panel before starting to to paint the the interior and be sure he would keep the strict perspectives of this entire composition the same with this one which we saw earlier on where Fabricius also used additional lines to be able to compose this scene so it could be 
viewed in this semicircular with a convincing perspective to it. Here we have a close-up of one of Vermeer's paintings and we can see just faintly lines here in the raking light of that there is a line in between the tiles in this painting. Uh, this painting uh, I saw like this uh, when it was recovered after a robbery. The painting is this one and it belongs to a, um, a uh, Irish collector or it belonged to an Irish collector. Uh, it was stolen uh, some time before we wanted to make this uh, exhibition about Vermeer's paintings in 95-96. We asked this painting for the exhibition, although we knew it was stolen, hoping that would, it would be recovered. It was recovered. It was in the back of a car in Antwerp. It had been down here to Istanbul at some point. It had been other parts in Europe within a drugs deal. And it had been kind of trading material. But at one point, the drugs deal was finished and the, paint, the car with the painting in it was abandoned. Police was called and this painting ended up in Antwerp in the storage room of the museum. And there I saw it lying in raking light on the table when I came in and saw it for the first time and noticed these incised lines between the floor tiles at the bottom, which was, oh, which is down here. Um, was that just to help himself that Vermeer would kind of use a ruler or something to create the illusion of perspective. Did that perspective from that letter mean, or that diary mean something for this particular painting? And while studying it closer, we discovered that here in this eye, there were two holes right through the paint layer. We thought it could have been vandalism or something like that. It's not very nice to prick a needle through the eye of a figure in a painting. But when we look closer, we could see that exactly this is the vanishing point of the perspective within this painting. And by discovering this vanishing point, we could suddenly begin to comprehend that Vermeer was creating <laughs> perspectives uh, and that the notion of perspective was different in the 17th century than current art historical uh, technical knowledge would know. And I had the opportunity to examine all 34 paintings or 36 uh, <coughs> paintings by Vermeer and in uh, about 20 of them we rediscovered a hole in the paint layer in the vanishing point of the perspective. Here is the milkmaid by Vermeer which hangs in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and uh, the vanishing point could be seen in the paint layer itself and you could see it on the x-ray as well as a small hole where there has been a needle pressed through the paint layer. Uh, the <coughs> funny thing is that it's exactly over the milk running out of the jar uh, and it fits, it sits here exactly with the windows up here that goes down to this particular point. And this despite that this room has nothing but the window that illustrates a perspective. Still, Vermeer took the trouble of calculating precisely that it should be here, that the vanishing point should be. In this painting up here, a detail of the elbow of the uh, piano playing or clavier simple playing woman, we see also clearly the hole in the paint layer where the needle was placed. Now, why do I know it's a needle? I know that because I have found another painting. Well, there you see the perspective in that painting. It's a diagonals in the tiles, which are just as difficult to compose than uh, the tiles themselves. So you will still need guiding lines <coughs> and to the windows, to the table here in front. Uh, it all fits very well. Here's an early painting in the Metropolitan Museum in New York with a soldier talking to a girl and also here there's a small hole in the paint layer for this window. And here we have the painting from Dublin, which is a late painting in Vermeer's oeuvre. And the difference between the early and the late is that the distance points that I mentioned in combination with the drawing by Friedemann de Vries, they are moved further out. They are farther away from the vanishing point. Now they are very far away. And the reason I mention this is, and it may sound speculative, 
but uh, books from the 17th century that describes perspectives talks about uh, not only the fact that when you want to have a complete illusion of this painting, for instance, you would have to stand exactly at the same distance from the painting as the distance point is to the side. So the, the right place for this painting would be would be up there or in there. Uh, which has something to do with how do you perceive a painting. We know from inventories that some of Vermeer's paintings, like Gerard Dow's paintings, the, the first pupil of Rembrandt, they were seen behind doors. So you should open a little door to see the painting. A hinge doors on one side of the painting, you would open this and you would see it, or you would have two doors. If you have doors on a painting, you need to be pretty close to the painting to open the door and then you see the painting. So therefore the artist would paint it so that the illusion would be best exactly when you open the door and not when you are at a far distance from it. Because then that discovery doesn't make sense. The peep shows, the peep boxes of Fabricius, all this is happening in this particular period here in the Netherlands, where you're playing with your senses as a spectator when you're looking at these objects. And the paintings are the only ones that really can give us a clue about what goes on. They are our best archival material to understand the past, both from a scientific point of view, but also by simply looking and comparing with literature and resources. Here is a painting, it's not by Vermeer, but by a Swiss artist called uh, Albrecht Anker. Here's a needle, and here's a string hanging out of the painting. The artist died, the painting is still on the easel in his studio in Switzerland in the late 19th century, in the 1880s. And he's having a needle sitting here with a string, a string that you can lift up and continuously during the entire painting process see if you are still within the laws of perspective. You can continuously control yourself without using rulers or any other devices. It's an extremely easy and handy way to control your, your illusion of, of three, dimens 3 Ds, three dimensionality. And it has been used already in the early Italian frescoes. You have uh, the notion of a string. You uh, put chalk on the string. If you put it onto the wall and you hold it in the other hand and you snap the string towards the wall, you get a chalk line. And you can paint up to this line and you can make another diagonal, take the string, fix it on a nail, hold it here and let it snap back on the wall. You had a new line and you can continue to paint and be, stay within the perspective. Uh, all crafts painters knows this very well. A lot of other crafts knows this too. Brick layers, when you want to make a straight wall, you also have a string up here to guide you while doing it. And why should a painter uh, be going through great difficulties if there was an easy method? Uh, in the 17th century, at the time when Vermeer is working and Rembrandt is working, the eye is being discovered. The German uh, scientist Kepler is beginning to understand how the eye f functions, how we see and perceive. Um, and Kepler describes the eye actually as a camera obscura, like a small uh, dark room in which this image from outside is being painted on the inside so that we can, with our brain, see what goes on. But in this manual here from the 1640s, it's still illustrated with the eight of small strings, you can see going up to the eye of the person, these strings fluffy out. When he keeps them taut, he, can, he describes how do you see uh, space in various ways by illustrating that seeing, which is still what's believed at this time, seeing is an activity that you have to do yourself. You have to be active to see. In opposition to today, where we know that seeing is something you can't help doing if you open your eyes. Uh, this was something you had to see, and this is one way of teaching each other how to look at things. Here's a camera obscura. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, it is a small box, like a shoe box. If you put a lens in one side, and you have a lid you can open, 
and inside you have a, a window and you look down on a mirror, then you would be able to see what comes through the lens inside the box on this mirror, which again can be projected up towards the inside of the lid and you can trace it, for instance. This is from the early 18th century. This kind of box with a lens that supposed you point it towards a bright scenery like out there, which is very bright, I can still see from here. Um, you would, that bright light would simply transmit itself in here in the box and you could use it as the first old cameras worked actually. The Kodak Instamatic camera works exactly like, like this in principle. Um, but this didn't exist in that particular time. If you have a magnifying glass at home, any of you, uh, a large magnifying glass, and you stand in your room and you have your window with a lot of light on the street outside or whatever, and you hold your magnifying glass up here, you will see the image of the window and what happens outside over here on the wall. And you can find carefully exactly at what point you would get the ideal representation of the window. The problem is just that as it is a lens that you use for this, the image of that window will be upside down and in reverse. This is what this produces, an upside down, reversed image. I will keep that as a little cliffhanger. What has that to do with Vermeer? Here we have a large image of a very small painting. This painting is only this size. Of a girl with a red hat, she's painted on panel. She's hanging in Washington, D.C. If we look closely at her dress, at these funny heads, lion heads here on her chair, and I think I have a close-up of this, yeah. Uh, then you see that they are painted out of focus. It looks as if it's just blobs of paint, and you cannot really focus on it. Uh, it is a lion head, and here as well, from a so-called Spanish chair. that would have its chair back here and its seat out here. And uh, when you go close to this, also here you see uh, the notion of one art historian is that all these paintings by Vermeer was created with a camera obscura. That he was standing within a room, his room, and this is where the lens would be, and this is the image that would be reproduced. Apart from this painting, that would be reproduced outside the room. But that could be explained by room sometime having a window from one room to the other in old Dutch houses. There's just a problem that here is the house and here is the street, so there couldn't have been a hole out to a adjacent window, uh, a adjacent room. I believe that what Vermeer is seeing is the lens in a piece of shutters, if he has ever really seen this. But I, I can imagine uh, like these two gentlemen, and he's standing here with a stick pointing to the feet of a man who has his head down here. Here's a tree because this is the image upside down, as you would see it with a lens in a window. But you see, you have to be in a dark room or a very subdued room to see this. Would you imagine a painter sitting in a dark room to paint where you can't see the colors? Would you imagine an artist making a great composition by having it upside down in reverse, not being able to imagine entirely how it would be when it all turns the other way? I have a very great difficulties in understanding this. And when the girl with the pearl is being viewed as produced with a camera obscura, because of the unclarity of these things out here, the blobs of paint here, that we can't interpret the textiles, as I told you. I believe it has to do with an artist with a great creativity, knowing, especially in a period when the function of the eye and when Leonardo da Vinci has wrote, written a manual uh, already early on, which was published in 1651 in Paris about the sfumato, the soft contours or the lack of contours, the lack of, of transition between one part of an object and another. This is what Vermeer is playing with. He knows, to my belief, very well that by having this slightly out of focus, we are forced to return to her face because the human eye does not want to look at something that's out of focus. We go where the focus is. And this accentuates the, our, in, the intimacy between this figure and ourself as an as a onlooker, as a viewer. So I think he's playing the trick of really focusing us, assisting us in looking, like the perspectives themselves 
are assisting us to understand the images. And here's an, a frontispiece, uh, the front cover of a book on perspective again. This woman here is having a palette in her hand with brushes sticking out down here. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but the allegory of painting, and she's being trained by the allegory of measurement with a compass, a lineal figures on her a plumb line here is a, is a chalk line hanging down. So only when an artist knows about distances, uh, about perspective and so forth, then an artist can create the right image. There's nobody talking about a camera obscura at this time. Well, the view of Delft is an image of this kind. The girl uh, pouring milk is a perspective after all, with a sfumato. Notice this kind of soft transition between the white wall and the, the uh, dark dress. You have it the same in this painting by Vermeer, which is this painting in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the girl with the water pitcher, or the woman with the water pitcher. Uh, also there you have this kind of radiation, soft sfumato transition between the black and the, and the white wall behind, which corresponds entirely with uh, Leonardo's notion of understanding the function of the eye, that when you have a dark object in front of a bright object, the light being reflected from the bright object behind would always fold itself around the dark object in front and therefore make a soft contour. In opposition to, uh, I will return to that, in opposition to having a bright object in front of a dark. Um, ultramarine blue, this blue uh, headgear of the girl with the pearl and the blue cloth on this table are made from natural ultramarine, which is coming from uh, Afghanistan via Istanbul, Venice, and all the way up to the Dutch. Uh, it's used in this tablecloth. It's extremely expensive, more expensive than gold in this particular period of time. But Vermeer also used this as an underpainting here below the red dress to accentuate the color of this particular shade. It's amazing that you have the economy as a painter to do this and would probably explain that Vermeer did not rely on painting for the market but was relying on painting for commissions. People would come and order a painting, pay it up front, wanting it to be made of the best materials. And this would probably also explain why Vermeer's oeuvre is so, so, uh, so limited. Here you have a chair, the same, ultramarine blue, you have the light falling into the room from the left. You have small copper studs on the chair. But look here, Vermeer is playing a little trick on us. There's also a re reflection from a light source coming from this side, being reflected in these small copper nails on the chair back. There's more light jumping around in these interiors than could be from a natural light. You have the shadows from the light falling down here, but look at the, the legs from this musical instrument how can there be shadows from these two legs from a sun that falls down here and there's a box, the, the depths of the instrument towards the wall. It's as if there's a light source here that makes this shadow. He's playing a trick with us. He's helping us to interpret the painting, but painting things that couldn't be real. The image in this mirror is not a representation of what we see here, but it looks like a representation. So we believe that it is a realistic interior. Look here, the, the uh, lead bars <coughs> in, the, in the glass and lead window are bluish in hue because the lead, the blue light from outside folds around these dark contours against the bright background. Very subtle, small understanding of the diffusion of light within this room. The blue tiles on the floor of this particular painting in London, it's in the Queen's collection, do not contrary to the late painting of the girl writing a letter. They do not have a sharp contour, but a soft contour again. And this black tile is composed of black and ultramarine blue mixed together. So it's an extremely expensive black tile that he has painted here. And you see the bluish hue of the light that falls into the room, the blue sky. Well, the light from a blue sky has a color in Vermeer's vision. It is bluish. And there is one color, however, and here you had the legs again uh, with their shadow, which 
doesn't really function according to, to reality, but it, it works well and nobody really questions this. There's one shadow in this entire room, uh, or there are two shadows, which are surprising. The one is here below the window, this wall, which is kind of ochreous in tone. This entire wall is first painted ultramarine blue, and then the sum of all the other colors, as also Leonardo writes it, has been projected on it in the familiar sense of applying ochres over it because the deep shadow, as Leonardo writes, is not entirely black, it is deep blue because all the, the darkness of the sky is deep blue, it's not entirely black. And it looks like this is what he's taking literally in this painting and used a large amount of the most expensive pigment to first paint this wall bluish and then cover it up with ochre pigments. And then there's this little, little, very tiny little shadow up here, which is reflected light from the sun out here from the street, which is projected up into the room. That little shadow is not blue, but brownish, because it's again the sum of all the colors outside on the streets, on the pavements, that's being reflected back, so it cannot have the bluishness of the, uh, of the sky, of the direct sunlight falling in. Here is the geographer uh, in the Louvre uh, with his astral globe, and you see a reflection here of light from this globe, reflected back here as a small diffuse circular light reflection on the wall. Uh, just like this interior um, by a painter called Van Fleet, uh, where you see reflections or images of light coming in here from windows that must be over here. So by having this reflection on these pillars, you certainly can, within your head, finish off this room, uh, although you can't see it. And maybe that's the same Vermeer does in this painting of the standing girl at the Virginal, because on the back of this chair, you see a very strong light falling on the back, although it looks as if she's standing up towards the wall. So we again get the illusion of there's more to it than we actually can see here. Very delicate kind of play with lights. And this painting uh, we have seen before, if you take it up close, we see the diffuse contour here with the dark image against a bright wall. And here we have the bright shirt, and there you have a very crisp contour actually up towards the, back, the black background. So he does play with these things according to what theory and his own notion tells him. So this is what we maybe in the 19th century thought about Vermeer romantic vision sitting here and the milkmaid is doing the dishwashing after dinner and he's having all his props around him. Uh, this is probably not how it was in reality. We believe much more that Vermeer was in dialogue, could have been him standing here and here is one of the connoisseurs, one of those ordering paintings in dialogue about how can you finish this painting for me so it really represents what I would like to have. And supplying with sufficient uh, economical means uh, to make this happen. We know a small uh, seascape painting, a painting of a, a, a, a waters with small boats on them like the, the Dutch place, uh, paint so often, and the blue sky was painted first with ultramarine blue. The buyer didn't like this hue and was painted over in a different blue with azurite, uh, but the owner still paid a high price because the ultramarine blue was in there. So it became a precious painting despite you couldn't see the presence of why it was precious, because the material value added to the value of the painting as well. And this is interesting with the Vermeer's paintings because it is said that when Vermeer dies in 1675, three years after the bankruptcy of the Dutch Republic, which made uh, a lot of people uh, completely uh, devastated by their loss of property, also, Vermeer's family was hit by this. Uh, there was the wars and the, the, the grounds, the, the, the farm grounds, farmlands of Vermeer's mother-in-law, who throughout his whole career subsidized him with pocket money, uh, didn't have any income, and she went back up too. Vermeer continued, even after this, to paint paintings with enormous amount of ultramarine blue embedded in the paint layers. So he must have had uh, customers that could supply him uh, because he wouldn't have any money himself. 
This is a painting, uh, an early painting from, 19, uh, from 1656. I'm getting to the end now. Uh, from 1656, the earliest signed painting by him. Uh, here is a painting that was thought to be his very earliest, this painting here. Uh, when we had the exhibition about Johannes Vermeer at the Mauritz House and in London, uh, in, in Washington, in 1995 uh, uh, and 96, this painting to the left was catalog number one. Uh, and it's supposed to be a copy after this painting, which uh, is in a private collection in Ferrara in Italy. Uh, the main difference between the two is that here is the crucifix, which this figure hasn't. It's Saint Praxedes. She's wiping up uh, blood from this uh, decapitated person lying in the background with a sponge and collecting the blood in this, uh, this container. But is this really the first version and this the second version? Painted by Vermeer when he was in Italy, which we have no evidence of him ever having been. Well, looking close, apart from the crucifix that's not here, then you see this finger is having the flesh color as the rest of the hands. This finger here uh, is kind of redder in tonality. And when you see the next slide, uh, the x-ray, you can see that here is the finger clearly visible on the x-ray, but here it is not. In the first version of the copy of this one, if this is the copy, Vermeer forgot the finger, and you can see here in a close-up that they are painted over the back, the black background of what's here behind. Why would you, if you copy a painting, forget the fingers? Quite odd. Another thing, if you are copying from an original, would you then not paint from front to back? So when you know that there are some houses here that protrude down here, and here's the detail, why would you let the, paint the houses first and then paint the corpse over that? Because that's what has happened here. Again, a little bit strange when you copy a painting. And this container here is painted over the red uh, drapery of the saint. And all the way in here, you have this red. So the container is painted over the red drapery. Also very strange. Why would you spend a lot of expensive pigments painting a drapery and then just cover it all up when you are, after all, just copying? And here is a detail which has no significance to the composition. It's down here where you see the way the brush has been applied, a little bit shaky hand. It's a tiny, tiny part of the painting with this wavy brush line. A wavy brush line that's found exactly back the same way in the drapery of this painting. And this painting is by the Italian artist uh, Felice Ficarelli. So the conclusion of this little research was that Inventory number or exhibition number one in our exhibition with the St. Praxedis was not by Vermeer, but from uh, Italy. It was the first version of the St. Praxedis. And if I go quickly back, sorry to do this, this here is the copy after this one. Uh, this one is where Felice Ficarelli, the Italian artist, is composing the image. This one has no pentimenti, no changes whatsoever and is painted by another Italian artist after this one. So it didn't, the art historians didn't succeed in making a link between Vermeer and Italy as having been traveling there, uh, unfortunately maybe, but uh, it was just another painting by Ficarelli. This painting, however, was not included in the exhibition, but was still hanging in Belgium in his private collection but should have been included in the collection, uh, in the exhibition. It was not sought to be Vermeer in 1995, but uh, analysis carried out uh, in the uh, Metropolitan Museum, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, proved to all uh, clarity that it's full of ultramarine blue, like the other paintings by Vermeer, uh, like this one here, there's a lot of comparisons. And when we compare to another of the late Vermeers, there are so many uh, things that uh, harmonize with this. And the clue to it all was that this little painting by Vermeer in the Louvre in Paris is painted on a piece from the same canvas as this one, 
So it's from the same roll, and they have been sitting very close next to each other on one piece of canvas. So we got one extra painting in. So what started with the conservation treatment and big surprises ended up in a film <laughs> by some. This is Vermeer and a book uh, by Tracy Chevalier. I hope that all this has revealed some of the notions of what Vermeer is trying to do and what he's teaching to greet in the book of Vermeer. Uh, we are getting closer all the time, but also in this case, we can get much closer in understanding Vermeer and the girl and all the other paintings. Thank you very much. If you are not just running away immediately out to enjoy the, the great weather, and if the organizers allows, you may have one or two questions. But otherwise, no, everybody's exhausted. <laughs> Understandably, thank you very much for listening for the whole day. I thank you also, Jorgen, for coming to Istanbul and sharing his knowledge with us. And hope to see you again here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Güzel bir sympozyum oldu umarım. Ee, tekrar sizleri de aramızda görmek üzere. <gülüyor> Çok teşekkürler. <gülüyor>